I'm saying things because I've taken myself off of mute like a clever person. And then we go to the fancy soon screen and it's all over the place. And it's still got the Las Vegas review. Oh, no, we're going to get in trouble. We're going to get in trouble. We've got Magnus there. Hey, Magnus, you can say things too and then people will hear you. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, Magnus is, has been on the show before, but he's going to, to join us for, for something more sophisticated. He's going to give us some boots on the ground reporting and c- get his opinions, his Canadian opinions, on the news. And I assume your opinions are all going to be very much based on hoping everyone has, has fun. I, if we're going to do Canadian, this... Canadian. I like everybody to be happy. If we're... I don't... Is, are, we, are we buying that stereotype? There we go. Get, I've got rid of the, the Vegas now. Vegas is gone. Smiling assassin. Yeah. That's what I we should know. talk about. We should talk about the Braun documentary. Oh, gosh. Well, I've already... I saw the season, so I'm not sure how interesting that's going to be to me. And all, all I can get annoyed with oh, is if oh, they try and paint yeah. a picture that they were, like, plucky underdogs when they were Honda. Uh, no. No, you should watch the Braun doc. It was so good, my wife watched it with me. And you know she's not a huge Formula One fan. Yeah, I've just remembered that I was the voice of the um, podcast advert for it. So, um, yeah, everyone go and watch the Braun documentary. No, it's Disney Plus, isn't it? Can we say that? Yeah, we can. We can say whatever we want. Let's. Uh, all I want to check from the live stream is can people see and hear us? And Stuart says, hello, Magnus. So that is a good indication hello. that we can be heard. Um, who's in there? Let's see. Mike is in there. Bruce, hello Bruce, Uncle Steve, EJ, Skoll, EJ, and who we got? Who else have we got in here? Adam. Oh, Adam, who is I, I hate Adam Rosales, right? He's um. If you're listening in this, if you're watching in the Slack group, you hear from Adam. He's an active typer, and then I, I realised he does some F1 streams himself, and also that he is a MotoGP fan. So we, have you, you heard him, didn't you, Matt, on the MotoGP podcast? And it was yes. so annoying because he jumped on the mic. And instantly he just had this like Morgan Freeman, like the thing I like most about motorbikes is just how dignified I sound when talking about them. But like in a like a more of an Austin yeah. type accent. And I was just like, no, oh, your setup's better. Your your voice is better. This is terrible. You know, my ego, Matt, I couldn't I can't stand for that. Well, no. it's a good thing you never saw the original Hades town with Patrick Pride in it or whoever he was, was who was the base is it the like we went yeah. to see it and he opened his mouth and uttered his first line and it was just like I don't that's have it. that. I'm done. Magnus I, has I got just, a bit of that. You've got a bit of the you've got a bit of the bass going on, Canadian bass. Oh, de- depends what I'm talking about, I suppose, or who I'm talking to. I'm glad I've got a better mic than you though. At least I can outpower you mic wise. You certainly do. Yeah. So, but here's the bad bit, right? So Adam we had this silky voice when we were recording it. But we were using we've been using Riverside FM, so that we're probably going to keep using that in the future, but it's not quite what we need for this mainstream. But for prereqs, it's great. It records things locally at, at his end, uh, but we haven't worked out the settings yet. So although he sounded brilliant on the call to me, his local recording was, was clipped and a little bit distorted. So I had to right. save the audio, you know, using my normal processing, and, and it made it sound worse than my setup and, and not as good a voice on the thing. And I was like, yes, I've accidentally done that, but how do I can convince everyone I didn't nerf him on purpose? I didn't. So... So it was basically the drain cover of the recording. It, a little bit. Yeah, it was the, oh my goodness, too soon. <laughs> too soon. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't know if, how, have you got any insight on that beyond, you know, the, the clamoring? Because we've spoken a lot about that bloody drain. I, I haven't yet reached out to people I know who might know more than we already know. Magnus knows everything though. You, but, you, um, Magnus was probably involved in the procurement of drain covers the, the, at some point. The, <laughs> the, the, the big question that I really had, and this is just based on the wording in the like the local paper and stuff like that, was who exactly signed off on that yeah, design? They'll never tell was us. Was it FIA or was it or or was it just the the promoters, which in this case was some F- subset Liberty, of yeah. Formula One? If I had and to guess, and I will, yeah. <laughs> that that has got to be a promoter thing. That has got to be the 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 event so it's probably falling on liberty that one well and i i think that's what i find really interesting about the fact that this is the race that they're promoting and clearly they have ambitions to promote more races going forward Mm. but when you are typically in a position where you can point the finger at everybody else and now you have to take that head on yeah and i know that was annoying for people watching it on tv but for people at the race it was you know even uh even more of a challenge and so 
you know, <laughs> you don't see people running around with Liberty Media on their shirts, but ultimately they are the ones that have to to answer for it. And and they're the ones that are facing this uh, mm. class action lawsuit. Didn't they sort of try to separate it off a little bit and they had like a some kind of company that is the promoter so they set up like a separate promoter. I, I'm sure I'm sure from yes. a legal perspective yeah. yeah that's what you would do for for anything but everybody knows that it is you know their race and um you know those types of of responsibilities ultimately all fall onto them. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Right. Okay, so let's just double check that you're on that that yeti. You sound clear. Your Magnus sounds clear to us, doesn't he? Well, um yeah. it's it's that sort of thing, right? There's always this balance when you get people on my my internal audio brain, I just want to get it perfect. I'm like, I could get another... Yeah. It's like lap time. I'm like, I could get another three-tenths out of that microphone. But then there comes, there gets to a point where it's just not fun anymore. <laughs> so you just have to go. Okay, so what I'll get you to do, Magnus, <laughs> well, um, is I'll just get you to push it like a couple of inches away from you. I know I said move it closer before. Okay. That's my bad. And yep. So I'm just getting rid of uh, a certain frequency range. I shan't bore you further. In fact, okay. what, she'll, what we shall do is we shall launch... I, do, I like the pre-show hangout, but at some point... You've got to get into the show. It's not not my rules. And it's recording at that end. It's recording in the thing. The car's spinning. This is great. I should refer myself to my notes so I know what to say. And then we go. I'm my own compare. That's no good. I need what I need, Matt. We need like a compare to come in. Maybe Mike Stoner to be to right. do to do the fluff. That's what we need. It's no good. Oh now, yeah, we we, we yeah. need like yeah, because like when you go to watch a TV show. Yeah. Like, exactly. like watch a TV show recorded. There's always a comedian who comes out and like warms up. That's the what audience. we need. Exactly. And people and, are sick and, of my yeah, voice yeah. already and the show hasn't even started. All right, let's go. You are listening to Mist Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Mist Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners, so let's be friends. It's a midweek news roundup, and Matt and I will be looking forward to the next race, which is the very last one this year. So we'll be catching up with some news like Toro Alpha getting a new name. There's a new engine has been born. Oh, it's got a little silver bow on it. Alpine finally being impressive, but how? And we'll discuss what's left to play for. We'll also get to some of your listener questions. And we'll be getting a boots on the ground report from the posh end of the Vegas Grand Prix from Race Weekend CEO Magnus Greaves. But let me remind you that we are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed. With the kind permission of our better halves, we aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first-ish. All right, boring one out of the way. We're joined by Matt Two Rumpets. Hey, Matt. Hey, I've literally forgotten what my bed looked like. Yeah, but there are normal timings, finally, for the uh, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. It does feel like if you want to be an F1 fan, even in Europe or the East Coast of America, these last Grand Prix have been unbed friendly. So I even, I even had to buy a sofa bed for the shed because eventually... Uh, Nick got fed up and was like, you're not coming upstairs at three o'clock in the morning. So I've got a, a, a whole set of toiletries in the downstairs bathroom and a somewhat sleepable on sofa bed in the in the shed. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, three o'clock is when I normally go to bed, but I wish I don't even mind that they're at weird times, but I wish it would be like a couple in a row that were at the weird time so I could get used to it. It's the bouncing around that really kills me. Yeah, so we're the real victims here. We're, we're hearing complaining about the F1 teams. Oh, we've got to fly to Abu Dhabi now. Oh, there's a 12-hour difference and it's logistically impossible. But we're the real we're the real heroes, Matt. Absolutely. I mean, they, they should come sit in my office at 2.30 in the morning and try doing show notes. Yeah. They're not getting woken up by horrible children uh, getting up They're for school. They're in private the jets. Day. Come exactly. on. Exactly. Get over yourselves. Yes, the whole team is in private jets. First class in Pit private. Crew well, and all. No. Um, uh, the, the, those guys, that that's like savage economy minus yeah they're in a raf hercules with chickens and chickens and goats running around <laughs> they're all out like a shoe and a t-shirt and everything else has to go <laughs> look you and me are guessing from our our various sheds but we have got boots on the ground and i'm, I'm very pleased that race weekends uh, magnus greaves is joining us hey magnus how's it going fresh from las vegas 
Rush from Las Vegas. It, it, I have to say, it cracks me up when I hear anybody complaining about time zones of races because I live on the <laughs> West Coast here in Vancouver, yeah. where pretty much every race is uh, at an unsociable time. And then finally, we get a race in the same time zone, and they put it on. Uh, they put it on late at night. But yeah, that that actually might change for next year, which I think could could be. Oh, an okay. Well, that's interesting because the reason we've got you got you in is because like you're a very you know connected person. You're like a you're like an F one octopus with tentacles everywhere. <laughs> so it's no surprise to me that you had the shall we say uh, the more glamorous end of the experience at Las Vegas. Fair to say. Mm -hmm. Fair to say. Okay. I hate you, but whatever. So listen, I, I've been, as you know, I've been very invested uh, in this race for the last year because we've been working with uh, the Wynn Resort in Las Vegas. So we've been able to get a real insider look at it in the lead up to, to the event. Uh, and then, you know, all the amazing events that went on during the Grand Prix uh, at Wynn uh, and then being, being at the race itself. I mean, the whole thing was was quite spectacular. My my biggest observation, well, one of my biggest observations is just mo like being in a position where we are so invested in it and just hearing all the negativity yes. in the years that led up to it was just, I mean, I, I've, a lot of it was justified. The pricing st strategy for the tickets was horrendous and all of that. Uh, but then at one point, as much as I believed in it, I was getting kind of nervous, but it was amazing to me that at the end of the, well, I think at the, from the opening ceremony, the 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 <laughs> the thought of the race started to change and turn more positive. Obviously, practice day not so much, uh, but it's incredible to me to see how positive the narrative has become, well, even yeah. from members of the British media. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so there's absolutely no denying that in the end it was a good Grand Prix. I honestly don't blame anyone, though, for having some healthy skepticism leading up to for it. Sure. Because a street circuits, like we are, we have kind of historical trauma with street circuits being pretty uneventful. Um, but I will say, like, it, it definitely had the ideal circumstances. So, for example, when I was speaking to Meg on The Ringer, I said to her, well, the only thing that can really save this race is... And I, I detailed exactly that, you know, shuffled up grid. Yeah, you were well, on. Well-timed safety cars. And it had it. And I'm, I'm glad because... They kind of really built it up. They put a lot of eggs in this basket. They've invested a lot of money. And even if the next few are slightly more Baku-ish, if you like, th this sure. being an actual good race must have been a real shot in the arm from a, a business point of view. Well, and, and I think it pulled off something which was amazing, which is that it was it was a great race for people that were in attendance. And it was also a great race for people that were watching on TV. You know, and that's just yeah. the race itself. The the whole atmosphere, the offering, everything throughout the whole weekend was was incredible. And one of the things that I love about I know you're not always a fan of you know city races, street races, but <laughs> so, it's me. No, it's, no. yeah. Well, I've I've heard I heard a rumor, but <laughs> you know when you're when you're there and you're trying to enjoy it, that distance between the the, the circuit and the best neighborhood in the city can often have a huge impact on how good of a time you have throughout the race weekend. Right. And so when you're, you know, when you have to get in your car, drive an hour, you kind of lose the atmosphere, but, but having this not, I mean, it's, it goes down the strip, which is, which is, you know, as they say, the entertainment capital of the world. And so for, for, for it to be right in the center of all the action for every hotel, casino, restaurant, bar, to be coordinated and putting on experiences and activations and shows. Um, you know, the timing obviously is late at night, but Las Vegas is a 24 hour city. So you finish at the race and you're just rolling into more parties and events. I mean, I, I can honestly say it, it was the most fun I've had at a Grand Prix in, in, in quite a long time. And I know you said that you were um, working with Wynn specifically. So, like, if I was to have been staying there and gone to the race, what would I have encountered when I came back from the race? Like, I get it because, like, you get you because, like, we hear the stories at, like, Coda waiting on the bus or, or yeah. even in England, Silverstone, 97 hours to get out of the mud-soaked parking lot. Here, 
you're 15 minutes from your hotel and your hotel is literally 97 nightclubs, 57 of the best restaurants in the world and a yeah. nonstop party. Exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of the, like at the Bellagio, you can stay at the Bellagio and be watching the race at the Bellagio from the bleachers that are in front of the fountains. You know, there was, there was transport from, you know, you could walk or I took the monorail, which was super easy. You know, there was some shuttle services. So it's very easy to, there's no downtime. There's no downtime, you know, at, at win, which was particularly great. So they, they hosted the Netflix F1 golf tournament. Oh, right. Did you go? Did you go? Well, to that? No, you know, what? I actually didn't go because I was doing some other things at the time, but they, they hosted that. They hosted the Sotheby's uh, auction of Lewis's car. Right. They, sh- they had a uh, advanced screening of the Michael Mann Ferrari movie. They had the opening night party with red carpet where all the drivers and just an endless parade of celebrities showed up. Uh, and then there was just, Oh, and of course the most important thing, which is, uh, Lewis's plus 44 pop-up, which we were, as Race Weekend, we were part of. So it was it was just nonstop. There was just great things going on all the time. Uh, okay, I will talk to you about that pop-up in just a moment. But getting to that event, I guess there's there's a few me- measures of success. So one, was it a good race? They got they got the good race. So credit yeah. where it's due. And we, no, we did this on no the doubt. race review. We said it looked like the track really focused in on making sure there was a few good over- overtaking points and it was wide enough. No one got bottlenecked like Singapore. So even if you hadn't have had the well-timed safety cars, there still looked like an opportunity to race. And then I think they've lucked in a little bit. I don't think this was a consideration. They lucked in with having low grip on the tyres with the cool temperatures and uh, lucked in a little bit as well with uh, the low downforce combination really suiting the fact that they can then could then follow and and that led to good racing so that's one measure of success the second measure of success probably did everyone make make money but before that the grandstands did look like they had a lot of space and you and i were chatting in the lead up to the grand prix i was desperate to get out there and had the tickets been priced sensibly i'd have been on a plane so so and again i i observe and i can be very objective i have no financial stake no, no, in, the, no, sure. in the, how the race performs the first two set days i was very concerned because the 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 grandstands that i was looking at were pretty empty uh qualifying it was better and then it was absolutely packed on on race day and 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 this is what i find interesting i mean there are some you know more established races with more established fan bases where somehow you get full capacity all three days yeah. i mean in that yeah silverstone you, for sure Silverstone or Montreal, you know, races like that. Clearly, with so many other entertainment options going on and maybe some newer fans or what have you, uh, it was a buildup. But I was happy to see that on the third day, it was full. And also, uh, one of our team members, Hannah, she came with me and uh, we were just sort of getting her a a single day ticket each day and taking advantage of those low prices. But then after qualifying, the ticket prices for the final day just absolutely shot up. So it was an yeah. interesting experiment to sort of observe how that was, those prices were fluctuating. Uh, so I'm, as always, Doran, I have two completely different questions to ask you. But since we're talking about tickets and prices, do you have any insight into how Liberty was running the ticket prices? And as a corollary to that, do you think their experience with Miami might have led them to initially overvalue where they set those prices. Well, let, let's, let's, and again, I don't know the, the full story, but you can Formula pretend. One, yeah, for, for, I pretend, but, but Formula One and Liberty are unbelievably clever when it comes to making money, right? So what they did at the very outset was their partners in the race all took huge allocations of tickets. So Formula One itself was covered right from the get go. Okay, so okay. let's. Just, so Formula One made a lot of money. I think what they did was they really told their partners that they could sell those, you know, easily for a really high price. And I think the first two waves of ticket purchasing, you know, would have would have would have done that. And then at the end, they were left with a bunch of tickets. But but again, when I hear people talking about oh you know, hotel prices have crashed and, and ticket prices have come down. If you sell tickets, if you sell 70% of your tickets 
inventory at that very, very, very elevated price, you're 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 locked in and you're good. If a hotel is putting their rooms out there at five to ten times their normal room rate and they sell 70% of their inventory, they've locked in astonishing profits. You know, they're just clever at the end in doing dynamic pricing to try and fill up every room. But I just make no mistake about it. This this event was a huge financial success for Formula One and for you know all of the hotels and 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 uh, you know the casinos that that are in Las Vegas. Okay, so this is interesting to me. So a lot of because Formula One and Liberty came in for so much criticism about this pricing, but what I'm understanding, if I've if I've got it right, is that a lot of the initial pricing really wasn't formula one directly selling right. tickets to those prices but it, it was providers sort of yeah I mean, casinos I, or package people putting packages together and stuff like for, that. for sure and i think it's i think you know it all starts with liberty saying hey these are what the tickets can go for but they kind of put the hype in there and then it was the you know their their casino partners and their corporate partners that were taking big allocations um, and look, they must have got rid of a lot of it at those premium prices and and therefore locked in, you know, locked in a lot of money. I think that the the pricing strategy needs to change. I think there needs to be a couple of more reasonable price points. Um, interestingly, both in the grandstands and also in the corporate hospitality, you know, because you know, even some very rich people I know were saying this is just, <laughs> this is just it's too much. much. I can do, really? you know, I can do other things at that same price. The other thing where where Formula One has a huge opportunity in Las Vegas is yeah. not like when you have an event like the Super Bowl, you know, only a certain number of people can go to the game itself, but so many more people come to town for all the peripheral events and, and activations. I've never seen this many events and activations as I did this past weekend. And I think, you know, you, you need to do the ticket pricing a bit better to make sure that the event is a total sellout. But also, I think that the hotels and casinos can get really clever to attract guests that just want to be there for the Formula One atmosphere and all of the peripheral events that go on because they were they were unbelievable. Mm. So look, I'm getting the sense that that you, for, as far as you're concerned, like that's a success. And almost the cherry on top was the fact that the Sunday race popped. Because I think yeah. even if it had been a bit of a, a kind of normal street race procession, they still would have been happy enough with the the money made. The event would still go on uh, forward. So I, I think like they, they've definitely rolled their sixes. And when it comes around next year, n no one is going to be able to be negative in the build-up that it won't be able to provide a good race because it literally 100% of the time, it's a good race. And, and and I think that's the number one, you know, sort of test. Was this a success? Is that you've you've managed in overnight, literally, <laughs> to turn what was the most negative race uh, conversation into an incredibly positive yeah. conversation. And it's you know, again, the bigger picture, people aren't really focusing on it. So that building that Formula One created, that paddock building, is incredibly impressive. And that's going to be there year round. And that oh, okay. is going to become their headquarters. It's going to become, uh, I mean, an event space. There's going to be different kind of programming that comes out of there. And so I think the big thing isn't necessarily just the race, but it's the fact that now Las Vegas is going to become a year round destination for Formula One fans. I, I tell you and what, that's yeah. the first time they've yeah. done that. And I tell you what, like Vegas for me was never on my radar really as somewhere for me to go it was not it's like a place from the movies it, you know it's some just far away mystical land but it genuinely is on my bucket list now to go oh we should go to vegas at some point yeah. and that, exactly and, problem, and, and they've changed their tagline from being the entertainment capital of the world to the sports and entertainment capital of the world so they have a hockey team they have a football team they right. just got the vote for the baseball team they're going to get an nba expansion team and then they put <laughs> okay. on the most thrilling you know, sort of Formula One circuit. And, you know, if most people, a lot of people go, like 40 million people, whatever it is, go to Vegas every year. You know, you have a, a pyramid-themed hotel. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. if you can have that, you're going to have Formula One-themed, uh, you know, restaurants and museums and all that going on as well. So I think that's the biggest thing about this race is is 
what's the infrastructure, the F1 infrastructure that exists there year round uh, that fans can go and touch F1 in a way that they can't anywhere else right now. Okay, so I, I think before we move on, I just have one final question for you. I mean, from what you have described, when and all the casinos have put a lot of effort into this. Now, the obvious reward is, well, you know, we sold enough packages to make money. But what is the long term here for these casinos? Why would they go to this much effort and invest this much time and money into F1? What are they what are they thinking they're getting back from it long term that it's, we may not be seeing just as fans watching the race right now? It, it's a great question. I think the first one, you know, is obviously always going to be money. Right. And money. they're about to host the Super Bowl no. in two <laughs> months time. And and without question, the economic impact of Formula One is much bigger than it will be that weekend for Super Bowl. Multiply that by the 10 years minimum that Formula One's going to be in Las Vegas. You're not only looking at like the potential for a huge return, but when you know that you have something for 10 years and it gives you the confidence to actually invest in it. Right. So you're not just sort of taking advantage when it comes to town. You might build something knowing that you're going to get at least 10 years you know, of, of value out of it. I feel that Formula One, as great of a job as they did of putting on a great event, I think they did a terrible job with the marketing of it going into it. It was very oh. one dimensional and it was very much playing on the usual tropes of Las Vegas and sparkly jackets and all that stuff. But I think that what the F1 fans around the world saw with all of the activations that went on around it, with what the drivers and teams are doing and the celebrities and the, the golf tournament and the auction and, and you know, all of that stuff, is I think they had a better representation of what what Las Vegas really is about as a destination. And so, you know, Formula One didn't capitalize on that on the way in, but I think all of the stuff that was happening uh, that made its way through social media and, and everybody else, I think fans can see really quite how broad the attractions are in Las Vegas. So I think that was very much in there, you know, um, as you're asking Matt, like that, that, that's why they, that's why they did this. And I think they, they hit a home run with it. Fine. Take it booked. Stop, stop with a hard sell Magnus. I tell you what, um, let's get into some, some F1 news, but I do want to find out what you were hey, doing. Hey, hey, you're not even going to ask me about our special Vegas issue. I, I, do, that's... I do. Come on. We've gotten half an hour into the show. Okay. okay. So, okay. Sorry. So hang around for more info on the Vegas issue. And that guarantees me that I get Magnus for a bit of Formula One news. Big dirty news. All right, then. See, this is what I've been wanting to do for a while, Magnus, is tap into your F1 fan brain as well. So the news is that Alpha Tauri, I, I don't know this is, this, if this counts as news, Matt, but the internet says that they are going to be renamed next year as Racing Bulls. And that angered me, not angered me, but for ages, we have been told that they're entirely separate entities. Like Christian Horner has literally gone out there and said they are entirely separate entities. And whenever you've suggested that Alpha Tauri and Red Bull might work together, it's been dismissed as a kind of mad conspiracy theory. Like, what, what are you talking about? We have been told they are different. They would never help each other. And But it's very clear that Helmut Marko could go on the grid in 2021 and whisper in the, the Alpha Tauri driver's ears, you know, uh, Verstappen, go, Hamilton, stop you know that that all happened in 2021 that's not a conspiracy but when i suggested that they should just slap a red bull livery on it and just start openly having a four car team people got defensive in the comments saying well everyone knows they they work together whereas we have been well we have been kind of pummeled with this no they're separate they just happen to own another team and any suggestion that they collude together is disgusting Right. You just didn't expect them to take you seriously when you made that suggestion is what this is all about. No, so it's a thing to delineate working together in the way that Red Bull and Alpha Tauri both being owned by the same overlord yeah. versus what they are and aren't allowed to do under the technical and sporting regulations. So it's an easy thing to confuse. There's lots of things that you're allowed to do 
You're allowed to buy a whole bunch of parts. You're allowed to follow more or less the same basic concept. We saw Haas and Ferrari make this work very well till the 2017 regulation change. And I think for the purposes of money, which seems to be a popular popular topic when you're talking about Formula One, Great. that they've just they've decided that it's going to be a lot cheaper if Alpha Tauri buys all the parts from Red Bull and follows along. They're going to get better results and it's going to cost them less money. And so there's nothing illegal about that. And then if you happen to have a Honda engine and your engine is leading the championship, well, then if you're slightly more spirited defending against somebody or it takes a little <laughs> extra corner or two to clear that blue flag well you know these are the things that happen in motorsports and in and in uh, you know world championships and so that's that's the way it goes i'll throw to magnus for this come on four car team uh, firstly it is a four car team secondly it's weird yeah I mean, honestly i don't know why you wouldn't just embrace it as much as you possibly could uh, and my issue is that the name ra Racing Bulls is it's uh, such a bad yeah, name. They left out the point from that name. It should be Racing Bulls Point. Yeah, well, there you go. They, but the, I just think that just uh, like what, what is that adding? What is that saying? What is that trying to position it as? I don't know. That doesn't. That part of it doesn't excite me. But they 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 had Toro Rosso, which is which is perfectly good. Which was the best. That was yeah. great. Which took me way too long to realize was just Red Bull in Italian. That honestly, when there was a light bulb moment when I found that out, I went, "Oh, you idiot!" How many, how many years in was it when you figured it out? I would say four or five. That it took a it took a long time. And then so why then did they move away? They went they moved away. I think to Alpha Tauri. I, I think they went to Alpha Tauri to try and make this distinction, to try and make this, no, 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 they aren't just a Red Bull junior team, they're a team by themselves. And and that was lies, really. And, right, and but, now they're dropping and, and then they, But then they tried to do that lifestyle play with the Alpha Tower clothing brand. Yes. And I just have yeah, to yeah. assume that that hasn't gone very well. So I don't know if that's being shut down it or It is, yeah. As what. far as I know, it's just being shut down, yeah. yeah. So, so that was a worthwhile experiment, but not well executed. So it feels like they're, they, they're now going to go, yes, of course, they're our junior team. Of course, they're really aligned with our aims. Of course, you know, we, we loan and we swap drivers and they're going to now buy parts from us. And, and, buy, and yeah, of course, it was that all along. That's what they're going to do now. They're just going to deny that they ever claimed it was a separate team. And that's, I, that's why I have, uh, keep my right to be irked, Matt. I find that irksome. Yeah, well, I mean, but the problem is they are technically under the technical and sporting regulations, technical a separate the team. There are certain team. things that they're not allowed to do. They're just not going to send someone from, from the Red Bull Arrow senior team to the Red Bull junior team like, like that. They're going to have to go through a gardening leave, and they're going to have to follow all the rules. And now, yeah, there are definitely ways around those rules. There's other ways for information to percolate third parties and so on and so forth. And this wouldn't be the first time oh, I've had a conversation about this. This goes back decades. So so don't, yeah, don't, but like, don't have you, go getting crazy about it now. Have you ever worked in any industry ever when they go, okay, uh, I know you're technically part of the same parent company, um, but well, they call that they used to call them Chinese walls. I'm sure there's a different name for them now, but they go, but don't talk about that thing that you're not allowed to talk about. All right, Derek, I can't talk to you about the that that contract. No, fair enough. Should we go for a pint? And then like 20 minutes later, you won't believe all these details about the contract. Like those things are just perme it's human permeable. Nature. Yeah. Yeah, I can't tell you about the contract, but we both work with this third party person yeah. who also has all the details of the contract. And I don't control what they say to you is, okay. is like how that game often Goes. will be played. Oh, I... But but if I'm right, what you're really on about is 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 Red Bull just using Alpha Towery or whatever they're going to become is like just two extra race cars who literally will, you know, have all sorts of random mechanical trouble when it's very convenient for whoever's leading the race if it's in a red bull or perhaps sometimes it's convenient when they're not leading the race for an alpha tower to just have to park oh my goodness okay so this gives some good suggestions because i think magnus's main point is correct it's just a, it's just a poor choice of name and it's just it's like they may as well have called it crimson bull 
or or red calves. Yeah. Random. Why don't they call it red calves? That would have been better. So you've got red balls and red calves. That, that would help. I like that. Anyway, I just think that's a bit weird. Let's move on. Uh, Matt, a power unit has been born. Oh, we're staying with Honda, I suppose. We're staying with the Red Bulls. So I... Not Honda. Forgive me. I thought... Oh, well, what's the power unit that's been born then? It's going to be Red Bull powertrain. Okay. Ford. Red Ford. Bull, right. Ford is their 2026 partner, because that's what you're talking about, right? Some exciting pictures of a potential. I power. have been assured that it's Red Bull have been powered by Red Bull powertrains for quite some time. What, what am I missing? How is the Red Bull powertrain being born? Um, well, um, they have constructed it, or at least a model of it. And I think what's different about it is that it's been very clear for some time that Honda has been keeping information from them. So this iteration, this new power unit that Formula One is birthing in 2026 will lose a very important part of the current powertrains, what they call the MGUH, will increase the amount of electrical energy in the energy store by quite some bit and will reduce the power of the internal combustion engine. And for help with the electric side of it, allegedly, not just, this isn't just Tag Heuer, we are told. <laughs> Tag Heuer. They're actually going to do uh, something? Ford is, is offering some kind of probably just access to their engineering archives and, and various expertise in building out hybrid systems. Do, do you know what my fantasy was when they said that they were going to rename Alpha Tauri and then there was all the stuff going on with Ford and the engines? Yeah. I was actually hoping that Alpha Tauri might become a Ford branded team. Oh, so like yes. Alpha Ford, Alpha Tauri Ford. Well, just like ford <laughs> like oh, i just thought so that would have yeah. been I thought, because they they have that relationship on the engines as we're talking about that's going to develop and they made this whole big thing that they're going to be rebranding it i kind of thought that would have been cool because then you would have had you know ford as an actual brand you know back in in f1 ford versus ferrari all the you know i think that would have been much more exciting for american north american fans than whatever this cadillac thing is that's being proposed or yeah. ford being some kind of third level arms distance technical partner what have you but it's not going to happen see that's a, that's a good question for since i've got a north american panel here so if i was watching indycar and that blew up in the uk as much as f1 has blown up over in over in your part of the world i don't know how excited i would be if they suddenly said oh there's a british manufacturer is getting involved like but to the americans i think you guys are much more patch, patriotic with your industries so like you guys are really like connected like ford america yeah well I, you listen but only, only when it comes in in a, in a positive way right so having having an american driver you know they're making such a big deal but let's get an american driver you'd only ch cheer for an american driver if they're going to do well not if you put them in a in, in a car at the back of the pack and i think the same thing is with the engines or partnerships or brands that come in like i don't know about you matt but i'm Cadillac entering that doesn't do anything for me, but Ford does, but more so because Ford actually has a great history in in Formula One, you know. But I think it has to be coming in at a at a high level, uh, and it's not. I'm not. I'm not going to cheer for a brand just because it's from North America. Aren't you? It actually has to be in a position to perform. I don't believe either of you. I like <laughs> this. I like this discussion because we're going to talk about all sorts of stuff. But the thing that I want to talk about is that in Europe, if you have a driver from your country in Formula One, you get much more into Formula One. I mean, we saw this with Vettel coming oh. back in Germany, and, and we see this with, with other drivers from other Australia. We, we, my UK. goodness. We even had it in yeah. the UK, Matt, because we had a, a big kind of, we had a bit of a dearth where uh, there, I think there was might have been a season without a British driver. And and at one mm. point we had Anthony Davison at the back, and that was our kind of sole thing to Stay do. Pad. And the thing is, they they Britain didn't really get behind Anthony Davison, and then Jensen Button came yeah. in, and we did have something to cheer for. But once Lewis Hamilton burst on the scene, I think the UK yeah. kind of you know the UK really got back behind Formula One again. 
But here, yeah. here in Canada, we didn't get behind Nicholas Latifi, and we're not really behind Lawrence, uh, Lance Troll. You so. traitors! But That's you what had I'm a saying. Villeneuve, at least. Wait, wait, but there you go. That's the point. When Villeneuve was in a great car and he performed, right? Yeah, you yeah. got behind yeah. it. It's or not two. enough to just be from a country. You have to actually, you know, give people something to cheer for beyond that. And this is bringing me to my point. This is where I wanted to get to because we have an American driver. And in fact, I would say based on um, Doralton buying Williams, I think that was a big reason why they moved Sargent to Williams yeah. Yeah. as soon as they did. I mean, he totally. did a good job in F2. He certainly didn't win it. And it would have been pretty normal for him to have spent at least another year there. But instead, they moved him right up to the to the big team. And I think it's because an American ish company Doralton <laughs> now owns Williams and they were like hey if we can get an American driver in there that's going to be class for us the problem is if you want to be good in Formula One you can't live in America and make a name here you have to move to Europe and go through the European ladder series F3 and F2 so anyone who's going to be really successful as a driver won't be a name in America. And I think this is why Ford and GM through Cadillac and Andretti, which is a very well-known name in America, is actually a really great thing for Formula One because their names, regular non-Formula One exposed people will still recognize and be like, oh, Ford's in Formula One. Cadillac's in Formula One. I know what a Cadillac is. Why are they racing in Formula One? I think it's a backdoor way to get Americans interested in Formula One who are outside the normal sphere of influence of motorsport. Totally. And I think you bring up an interesting point about Doralton. So Doralton is an American investment firm that's based in New York. So they're looking at it as, as team owners, they're looking at it from an American perspective. And so I'm with you. I knew that they would be the ones to choose an American driver because they're looking at it from the perspective of, of the United States. Other teams have now set up sort of sales offices, marketing offices in the United States. And I think, again, going back to Las Vegas, you might see even more and they might even be based over there, which is interesting because that feeds into Hollywood and that market, you know, as opposed to East Coast, New York advertising markets. But I find that interesting, right? So the drivers still need to go through the European ladder yeah. to be successful but now you're having more sort of American focused business thinking that would be more supportive of it. And now you have brands like Ferrari, uh, Ford and, and Cadillac, which, you know, are going to be providing the money that's going to bridge those two interests. So yeah, there could be some interesting developments. Okay. Yeah. Go on, Matt. I, and I just want to be clear when I say that you could be a driver who doesn't go through that ladder and still be a very, very good driver, but, the management of the tires has become such an art that if you don't have enough time to learn the Pirelli tires versus the Firestone yeah. tires, which we have in Indianapolis, then then you you really are at a pretty big disadvantage. And the other thing that's interesting to me is that when we do talk about drivers that are American drivers, like IndyCar drivers, the winners, they're not often always entirely from America, but it's just right. because they've raced in an American series, so their names are better known. Right. Well, okay. Well, well, we're, well, we're on the subject of talking about marketing in America land. I think I've got two questions for you, Magnus, seeing as someone who's, mm -hmm. who's plumbed in to the entertainment. Um, a, what do you know about this Brad Pitt movie? Well, unfortunately, it's been a bit delayed because yes. of the Hollywood strikes. Unions, um, am I right? Oof. Right? Hey, yeah. Did that affect you as well? <laughs> uh, no, no, not really. Because um, I, I, I just remember last time there was a, a writer strike. I'm really not tapped into like why there's a strike or whose who side I'm on or who won. Um, all I know that it, it did co cause like a huge delay in TV shows, and it was very yeah. annoying. So I'm assuming and, that and happens again. Yeah, and that and that's that. I find that part frustrating, you know, just as somebody who's who loves this sort of development of Formula One in North America. Is I, I thought that we would have this incredible period of time between the inaugural Las Vegas Grand Prix and the Brad Pitt film coming out mm. in 2024, right? I thought that would have been great, but now it looks like that's been pushed back okay. at least a year. 
because they weren't able to film for quite a while. Yeah, so they didn't get no, the, that, the footage. That, that said, you know, I was a bit late watching that Gran Turismo movie, uh, and I loved it. And my wife loved it. My son loved it. He doesn't care about car racing. And I just thought to myself, it, it, it brought me, sometimes I think we're watching Formula One races and it the way that it's filmed and, and we're just sort of, it's racing. It just seems kind of straightforward. They're just driving cars sometimes. But that film brought the sort of stress and excitement and everything that goes into racing. And so the idea of, highly capable filmmakers bringing that to the world of formula 1 i think it's going to be unbelievable okay but during for that for that film so i was able to uh, interview Jan Moldenborough and the, yes. the the lead actor whose name i have forgotten i'm so sorry but he was so good um but they had proper racing consultants on there and there was none of the fast and the furious oh downshift a gear to go faster on the straight it was all quite realistic uh, the racing more so than the sim racing i'm really scared with that that brad pitt one that it's going to get the ford versus ferrari treatment but but you i mean it's formula one has made everybody available it's brad pitt so everybody's mm. falling over themselves to to be a part of it lewis hamilton is a producer and we know lewis takes things very seriously uh so listen i i i I think it. I mean, look. What do I know? I'm not on the on the production team, but yeah. I have high hopes for it. I think it could be. Uh, I think it could be fantastic. Here's the problem I have, right? And this won't insult you, Magnus, because you're fantastically young. But Matt might be insulted. Brad Pitt is 59 years old. He's older than you, and he's going to play. I think the character is like a returning Formula One driver. Yeah, yeah. But 59 is pushing it a little bit, isn't it? You just haven't seen the technology they have these days, is oh, I all know. I got to say. If Fernando Alonso can walk back onto the scene <laughs> and be competitive at the age of, I don't know, 72 or whatever okay. he is, but I'm then, this out. then Brad Pitt is, <laughs> is in the realm of plausibility for an actor to play someone of Alonso's age. Okay, at least with Alonso, the Alonso story is realistic because if he's out of the race, what does he do? He gets a chair because people my age are like a good sit. So they've been doing an activity and they can be fine, but then they're looking around going, we, we should all sit down. We should all sit. But if the Brad Pitt character doesn't, isn't, if there's not a scene where he's desperate to get to sleep for the race the next day, but he keeps having to get up to pee, then, then it's not realistic and I, I want nothing to do with it. Uh, but the second thing, entertainment-wise, Magnus, it, the very exciting thing is that you got to collaborate with your fantastic magazine, Race Weekend magazine, got to collaborate with um, actually Lewis Hamilton, the real Lewis Hamilton. So first of all, I want to say to people, Race Weekend, it's the word race, and then you've missed out the vowels completely. So yeah. like w -K -N -D. W -K -N -D. And yes. it's, it's a very posh magazine. This is a premium magazine. And I don't know if this counts as a good thing or a, a bad thing, Magnus. You tell me if this is insulting for your magazine. But when, when we have guests around, I like I litter the sideboard with the thing because it makes me look like a posh person who has that kind of magazine. That's a great okay. thing for me to hear. Okay, so like rather than like I'm thumbing through it for the articles, <laughs> you know, it is very much photography based and bringing you to an era or a location or a championship. We, we, we call it a magazine, but it doesn't fill the normal format of a magazine, right? It's huge. It has amazing photographs. It doesn't have all those sections. And most importantly, it has zero advertising. Yes. Right. So, so, and each issue dives into a particular topic, F1 in the 1970s, and we go deep both visually and with the story. But the whole point of it is that, it doesn't just last for a month like a normal magazine is that you could pick it up anytime no. and, yeah. and, you know, and, and get something out of it. So no, that's exactly what I want you a to coffee do. Table, coffee table, coffee table magazine. And, and it makes us exactly. look like, yeah, it makes us look posh. And um, I was just looking around for one in my studio, but the lad's stolen it. So it's, well, that happens too. There yeah. you go. There you go. So uh, if, if it sounds like a shameless plug for my friend's magazine, it is absolutely that. I definitely think, have you still got, have we got But it deserves picks? it. It deserves it. It's such a good Thing. I mean, it really, uh, you know, it's like the National Geographic of Formula One, you know, because amazing, these thank you. Exploring stories and the pictures are amazing. And yeah, it's, it's something you will pick up and read and then reread later on and still enjoy it. And uh, I appreciate that. And what we did with this Las Vegas issue, you know, again, I, I referenced, I wasn't super impressed with Formula One's marketing going into this event. 
they were kind of positioned to get like they're the only race in town. But actually, Las Vegas has a great motorsports culture and history and options. Right. There's 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 so many tracks that are in Las Vegas where you can go and get some laps in during the day in a Ferrari or a doom buggy or a, a, a go-kart and then go to the race at night. You know, there's the mint 400, there's NASCAR, there's all this stuff that happens there. So it's like a huge motorsport city. And also once you venture off of the strip, you know, there's the arts district, there's incredible places to just rent a car and go for a drive out in the desert. There's just so much going on there. And it's a very artistic place as well. So we we look to capture all of that and then you know it, amazing opportunity for us to partner up with Lewis Hamilton oh, and plus that's four, what four. I want to ask okay okay so first yeah. first question first question you partnered up with Lewis Hamilton it's been building yeah. for a while did you get to meet Lewis Hamilton in Vegas honestly i did not get to meet oh, Lewis no. in, in, in Vegas uh, no i did not i did not i will <laughs> but i did not but he so he he was very involved on the sort of editorial direction of the of the of the magazine, obviously we worked with you know his creative team, and there was a lot of back and forth. Um, he was also using it as a platform to provide context for the merchandise collaboration that he did in Las Vegas with the artist Murakami. So that was that was incredible for us. And so Lewis gave a lot of sort of you know quotes that we were able to put into the magazine, uh, photographs that we've never nobody's ever seen before. Uh, and then he and the artist Murakami co-wrote a letter uh, about Las Vegas oh, and wow. their collaboration, which is exclusive to the magazine. And then it was so, you know, we don't sell in stores. We sell it online. Uh, but we did do something with the magazine at his pop up, uh, which happened to be at Win, So it all worked out really well for us. Um, but the 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 feedback on this issue of the magazine has been uh has been pretty spectacular. Is that available so, now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's on our it's on our website. We're just selling. So usually we've been selling magazines as a collection of four. Yeah. But this one we're selling it just the magazine on its own. Okay. Oh, that's brilliant. So look, when you say a pop up, like that, what does that mean? Like Lewis Hamilton's there with all his merch and his his uh, alcohol free tequila. Is that so? His alcohol free <laughs> tequila was around the corner at a different pop up. They sort of did a a, a bar within a bar, uh, <laughs> and that looks pretty cool. But he had a, a shop in in one of the sort of key areas of the the Wynn Hotel, the Wynn Resort, and that was up for five days. And I've got to tell you, it was packed. The like from morning to night, from open till close, it was packed, which was just really interesting to mm. observe. Uh, and then what I thought was quite fascinating was it was it was announced kind of quietly that Lewis was going to show up at the pop up on uh, on the Saturday and. Um, and so just the swarm of people that gathers for, for Lewis to come by. And it was really funny because actually through the middle of this, uh, Checo walked by with his wife. Maybe they'd been out for lunch or something. And and people were getting a bit excited. They're like, oh, Checo, Checo. And it was yeah, it was great. But it was She's, polite. She was there in case he wins again. You're right, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, half an hour later, Lewis shows up. And it was, you had kids that were brought to tears. You had... Just he was swarmed like a like a legit rock star. It was it was really unbelievable. Just to sort of witness that not at the circuit, but in a sort of mm. different environment and the way that young people, old people, you know, everybody reacted to him. It was it was a pretty cool moment, I have to say. And, and you couldn't quite get through through the scrum. Um, so we'll look out for that edition of Race Weekend magazine. If you if you Terrific. send me that link that we used before last time, or any link that will get our listeners to your product, uh, we'll we'll yeah. go and get them in touch with them. And by the way, like there is some like uh, what do you call it a vested interest because Magnus will often send me the magazines and I so I do get them for free, and that's why I'm able to to rave about them. Uh, but we we'd have him on just for his smiling face and his Canadian <laughs> pluck in any case. Magnus, uh, you're a busy man. We've kept you for an hour of your time. So we'll, we'll bid you adieu and we'll get you back on in the new year to keep us updated on the, um, the, the American drive in F1. And, and, and then I'll tell you about the race weekend cafe that we're opening in Las Vegas. No, you're not. Is it? I'll tell you. I'll tell you that later. Okay. Do I get nice discount, you guys? Do I get discount you get Americano? Free fries if you go. <laughs> you get. You get. A, I'll give you one of those. Uh, you can punch a card and get a free coffee every ten cups. Nice. Thanks very much, Magnus <laughs> Thanks, Greaves guys. from Race Weekend Magazine. Check the show notes below. 
Okay, Matt, that leaves that leaves you and I and our ugly faces to concentrate on uh, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. And I my, think, my ugly forehead, you mean? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have cropped you a little bit in the video. But thanks for being mindful of the audio listeners and making forcing me to explain my my video snafu. <laughs> um, but of course, the, the main thing that we have to look forward to is a more normal schedule. So we're ending the race on a nice normal weekend, no sprints, and also uh, some timings that will stop the UK people grumbling. And um, stopping Brits grumbling has surely that alone has got to be worth it. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to practice one at 5.30 in the morning like normal. Yeah, but the race and everything, that's fine. It's back to, in fact, I spoke to uh, some Americans earlier who said, oh, I'm glad it's back to being a coffee event. Yeah, no, I, I think... And, you know, this is this is one of the things has been even like the the team principals have been like, oh, yeah, that Vegas schedule, that was really hard. We were joking about it earlier. But I do. I, I think part of that was there is a lot of Saturday night sports on. And so there was just a very small window that would almost satisfy European viewers and allow people on the West Coast to stay up just a bit later than they normally did. And then was great for the Australians, who I guess, I don't know, we deserve to think about them occasionally, but was just absolutely toasted people who were, you know, covering the whole event. Mm, I think so, it's worse so, yeah. that we tease the Australians with normality and then take it away from them for, for another year. I think keep, keep them in their shed. If you, if you show them the garden, they'll just want to be in the garden all the time. Yeah, this is true. Can you imagine a whole season of that? Ugh, nightmare. All right. So uh, what is left to play for, if anything? Oh, I, you know, we, we, we had this um, and I went and looked it up again. Uh, basically, the biggest of big deals is Mercedes versus Ferrari for second place in the championship. And I know that in the world of Formula One, that's just first loser. But first loser is still ahead of second loser. So I think it kind of matters to Ferrari and Mercedes rather a lot. They are separated by exactly four points. Wow. Okay, so Toto Wolf said, the- we're going in just about level, but we'll, this time we'll have a proper race director, so we should be okay. And you go, when you add that to Toto Wolf's other comments, yeah. like, you know, talking about, well, firstly, he steamed into the weekend. I don't think we even covered this. He steamed into the Las Vegas weekend saying, I have an anger to deliver Lewis Hamilton his eighth title you know, brackets that he was robbed of. And yeah. I thought, well, that's all fine and well. And I did get the feeling that, you know, people, they, they, they are hoping to push forward and and return, you know, the justice and, and his eighth title. But how is George Russell feeling about that when he comes out and just goes, I have an anger specifically for this one driver for his eighth title? Russell's got to be thinking there going, oh, OK, so maybe the maybe the deck isn't stacked sort of fairly like I thought it might be. Well, I mean, uh, if I was Russell, look, when you sign that deal, you know the deal you're making, no matter how much you might pretend in public otherwise. Yes, he knows Mercedes will treat him fairly, according to their rules of fairness for drivers, version 17.4, because they've done the same thing with all the other drivers. But they also know uh, you, you can't sign that deal and not know that it's a mission from Mercedes to get Lewis the championship that, you know, oh, more than one or two people think he deserved in, in 21. Oh, and then yeah. to have, then to just like completely fall off the cliff with a car. Yeah, no, th- that is a long-term and important project to Mercedes. Okay. Doesn't mean that Russell's going to be treated unfairly. So there's a, but, f- there's a few yeah. things here. So firstly, Russell had been, has been lined up for Mercedes for, for a long time. So the whole plan was Williams for a couple of years to Mercedes. And then he, they couldn't, he couldn't get out of the Williams contract. So you, you get the feeling that he'd have probably been there in 21 had the stars aligned. But he, couldn't, he, he had to stay at Williams for a bit longer. So it was very clear Mercedes knew that Bottas wasn't the direction they wanted to go as much as they liked him. They wanted uh, Russell in. And all the talk when Russell came in, even in 22 was about it being a learning year, wasn't it? It was all, I'm here to learn, I'm here to pay my respects. And so Lewis Hamilton was meant to then, yeah, they were meant to turn up with the zero pod concept, which was going to be a killer, and they would clean up the eighth title, and then Lewis would retire, and then it's George Russell's team. It's still winning all the races on Mercedes servers, I can tell you that. 
Yep. So the simulations show that Lewis Hamilton <laughs> is now a nine-time world champion. He's retired, and George Russell is is in that box seat. So it has obviously didn't work out like that. And so this season, when there's no title on the line, yeah, George Russell has been more than fast enough in qualifying and with his alternate strategies to be in the way. So there's less of an impetus to go. Actually, George, just you know, get out of the way. But it was clear, sort of mid-season or mid to late season, say in Singapore, where he was up behind those um, uh, McLaren. No, I was up behind the Ferrari and the McLaren. No, the McLaren with signs ahead of him. But he didn't have any tires left to go attacking, and Hamilton kind of did. And then when it got yeah. to Suzuka, it looked like they were going to trip over each other again. The at the track team didn't seem to be imposing team orders, but Toto Wolf sort of phoned in from home to be like, "No, this has got to you know switch around." So I'm just wondering how this is all going to play out if Toto Wolf has an anger to make Lewis Hamilton an eight-time world champion, and he's the boss. At some physical point, they're going to have to say to Russell, "Dude." you know, shift, shift over. And how's that going to go down? Well, uh, we, we saw that with Bottas happen at one point or another, deep enough into the season. And, and it, it, it's just a thing. Russell and Lewis will start out every season absolutely equal. As the season goes on, if someone has an advantage and a chance, then in fact then in fact you will you will you will see if it matters because it may not matter if it's if you're having like a max for stopping oh sure yeah, yeah we're not going to tell perez to slow down and let you win an extra extra race you don't need to you're you're crushing it anyway um you will see mercedes shift to that gear that they did with botas and say look it's close lewis needs the points we hate to ask you to do this but if the shoe were on the other foot, we'd ask Lewis to do it. And you know we would because we have been absolutely fair with you and upfront about how we are operating. These are the rules. Everybody plays by them. The problem for Russell is as good as he is, and he's been good in qualifying, is he's, he's not quite yet got the mastery of, of tire management that Lewis has. And, and this is a thing theme that you will see repeated amongst between teammates. I think probably um, you could point at maybe Signs and Leclerc as being pretty equal on that. But everybody else, if you look deep enough, you'll see that there's usually one person who's better at it than others. And they tend to be the people who come through more often in the race. Russell is still learning that. Yeah, I just, I think it's in a horribly awkward situation now because whether whether they're, st they're not still doing the learning year stuff and there might be this kind of unwritten feeling that Hamilton's the senior driver, but no one is actively telling Russell that he hasn't got a shot at the title, for example. And and so he's the whole situation has outgrown itself. You've had two kind of dead years. And so let's say they turn up with a, a car that functions and a car that works in, in 2024, then they're effectively going to be in the, the situation they should have been in <laughs> this, the situation they should have been, uh, Matt's cat is interrupting the podcast, in, in 2022. So it's, it's if Hamilton is do dominating in that driver partnership again, four or five races into the season, and they've got a title shot, it will be so fascinating to see how quickly that turns. And will Russell actually get out of the way? Because I think the second you take a team order, uh, his stake, his stock goes down so much. So the second they get to Barcelona and go, actually, Hamilton's quite far ahead. We, we need let, let him through, please, George. Not only is the season kind of written off by then, he also then has the reputation of being another number two and that people will say, oh, it's another Bottas. And then even if Hamilton retires and he goes on to be the title contender, everyone will just say, well, he wasn't beating Hamilton. So think of where that car would have been had Hamilton been here. I think the only way George Russell can play this from a career point of view is he has got to do what he's been doing, frankly, and go fully wrecking ball. All that matters is Lewis Hamilton. Forget the rest of the pack. You've got to come out the blocks, beat Lewis. That's that's all you can do for your reputation. Even if it costs Mercedes a driver's title, he can't yield or his, his heavyweight fighter rep is, is gone. The problem with that, I think, is adequately demonstrated by Verstappen absolutely not helping Perez when he could have, not not in Vegas, where he did, 
and but Brazil. in the previous season, because Verstappen yeah. was still pretty peeved about that thing we think Perez did in Monaco, but we're not going to say it out loud because our lawyers have written us several angry letters. He did it. Perez did it. He crashed on purpose <laughs> in qualifying to cause a yellow flag and qualify ahead of Verstappen. I, I think uh, from anyone who's been watching Formula One as long as we have, you have that. Like, like there is something about yielding to your teammate just because the team asks that rubs the wrong way. And I think it goes back to Ferrari years and years and years ago. But in modern Formula One, if you want your teammate to get out of the way when you need your teammate out of the way because you're on an alternate strategy or because you're just faster or because they have a problem or whatever, but you don't get out of their way when you're asked to, well, guess what? You're not... So if Russell... If Russell is leading the championship and wants Lewis to get out of the way because it's coming down to the final points in the last race of the season, and he's not done that for Lewis in the past, guess who could be an awful wide car in the middle of the road for him? Oh, and I, and I, it just, it's, it's down to the team to make the drivers trust them, that they will be fair either direction. I think there's a very, very, very real possibility that if Mercedes have a championship winning car next season, Lewis Hamilton can end up losing that title due to early season competition. So, so Russell can win races, of course he can. And he could win a couple of races, but then Hamilton is edging him out over the first eight or nine races. And then you've got the rest of the season where they prioritise Hamilton, but you've already lost 20, 30 points. Whereas that just that won't happen at, at Red Bull. The second they know that they've got a Mercedes challenging, Perez won't be allowed to win a race. Just full stop. He just won't be allowed to, and and that will give Verstappen, you know, a head. And I, I really think that's what you should do in any team. I think every single Formula One team, if they're fighting for a title, particularly, should have a clear number one driver. And if Ferrari are in that situation as well, I think they're going to struggle because I think there's an internal political struggle there. I don't think they're going to tell one of those drivers to, to, to yield. In, and you need to do it in the first third because those points in the first third of the season, they're the same points towards the end of the season. Yeah, uh, they are. But you also have to let your drivers establish their order. I mean, we saw Perez win some races and he wasn't. They didn't tell him to slow down because Max is obviously the better driver uh, long term. In our, in our yeah, camp. but there was, no, there, was no, there was no title on the line there. But that's my point. In the mm. early part of the season, there isn't a title on the line. Oh, but it was so there? obvious. It was so obvious this season that they were they were going that it was a two horse race. But yeah, I see what yeah, you mean. But but yeah, the thing that w- where all of this to me comes to grief is: Do you really think if Mercedes has a potentially title winning car that Russell's going to be winning enough races with it? To, to put a serious dent in Hamilton's championship. And I, I don't quite see him doing that yet. If I'm being honest, and I know a lot of people like George Russell, I don't think it makes him a bad driver. Lewis has just got so many more years of experience and mastery of, of, of the tires. Um, that it, yeah. the, the better the tool you give the both of them, I think the, the more that will be apparent uh, especially in the races. He might he might do well in qualifying and might even win the races where qualifying matters most because he's young and 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 a little bit quicker over a single lap. But across a race, I, I don't yet really see Russell um, a, a, as a championship contender in the same way that I would see Hamilton if you gave him that car. Uh, last one on Abu Dhabi. Do you see the Alpines continuing their form from Las Vegas? And how how did, how did they look that good in Vegas? Yeah, well, it's the it's the lights. It's nighttime. Makes everything look better, doesn't it? Um, this is a really interesting one to me because I I hadn't thought they were going to do that well because power sensitive track, and uh, they have you know the by everyone's admission the weakest power unit. But what they did do is they brought some sort of aerodynamic refinements to their package. They had like a Monza spec rear wing. They had uh, a front wing that they developed to be good in, in low speed. And they, they had a new iteration of what is called sort of the beam wing that sits like halfway down below the, your standard rear wing. 
that was single element. And I, that might have been the first time they did it. And if you're wondering how I know so much about this, it's because uh, our friend Matthew Summerfield of Motorsport.com wrote a lovely little article about exactly what they did do differently in Vegas. But I think they were very favored um, also, you know, by chance in the actual race and that mm. Ocon was able to make up like 10 places at the start. And then they ran, um, they ran a good strategy from, from there. Uh, and I could talk about what happened there and why El Gasly ultimately got the worst end of things because I read an article by Bernie Collins about that, which I just happened to run across while I was browsing for other news. But in essence, they brought an efficient car that worked well in the slow speed sections and they had trimmed the car otherwise to be incredibly efficient on the long straights. And Ocon in particular was did a very good job of not only not only um getting better charge on his car through the corners by using different gears than Gasly, but also by not pushing the tires in the corners where the most damage was being done to them. So he was able to stop a little bit later. He had fresher tires at the end, just enough to make, to make that critical difference. And oftentimes, and it's not just Alpine here, I'm not singing Ocon's praises per se, but oftentimes when you look at teammates in these positions and you're like, why did one go so far back and the other went so far forward? It's down to things like, Oh, well, he used second gear in the first turn, so he got more charge because the engine was spinning at higher revs. The other person went for more apex speed, which actually punished the tires more and left him with left, less deployment down the next long straight. It's little things like that. It's fascinating to look at. But uh, yeah, Alpine, I'll tell you who to watch there. Matt Harmon is the technical director, and everyone made fun of him at the beginning of the year. But a lot of the stuff he's come up with has shown up on most of the other cars up and down the grid. I wouldn't write them off as much as a lot of people have because he's still there and he's still running the team. And they, they've been very creative and inventive across the whole season. They've just been struggling with the, with the actual power output of their power unit. Well, I won't write them off from finishing fifth, fifth. fifth. That's got that's their target for next season. I don't know where they're currently sitting. Oh, for next season, yeah. yeah. For this season, the six is like they have yeah. miles either side. So, of them. so fifth, and like if they could nick fourth, that would be a miracle. But I, I will write them off for a, a title shot for next season. Yeah, so I can well, write them well, off as far as that. Yeah, you can, but th they're also handicapped because they only have one team that runs their power Correct. unit. Yeah. That's and they true. can't fix it now anyway. So. Okay. If Matt sounded distracted during that segment, it was cat related. And I just feel like, uh, you know, that, that workplace sign where you have, you know, uh, days since Missed Apex last interrupted by cat. And I've just had to take the three off and put a zero back on he there. He broke in, broke in the office, opened the door on his own. That's not, cats don't, in. cats don't work like that. All right. Um, let's finish off by answering a few of your uh, emails. Okay, so uh, housekeeping, Matt and I are sort of planning to do a little bit more of, of this kind of thing in the week. And if we're able to grab a guest, have some news, answer some emails, that's quite a good format that we enjoy. And actually a format that we have missed, because when we only do the Sunday shows at the moment, it's completely on rails. So it's basically race after race after race. And I think we've had, so this is going to be five races in six weeks. So to do the kind of content that we want to do, we don't mind just hopping on midweek. And I, th I think a good format is to bring in a, a guest with the subject and answer some of your emails. So I'm trying not to be distracted by whatever is going on in Matt's office there. Absolute chaos. Let's see. First question was going to be for Matt, but instead I'll go for this one from Thomas, who says, I really like your podcast. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I have never seen a driver with glasses, although in their helmets they do not have an aerodynamic disadvantage. Do drivers just use contact lenses or do they have an adjustment in their visors? Thanks a lot. Um, hope you had a good weekend. Greetings from the Netherlands. Oh, you're our Dutch listener, are you? Okay, uh, I think this is quite an interesting topic as a, a short-sighted person myself. Um, if we go through the history of Formula One, I think it's only been 
Jack Villeneuve, who I can remember in recent F1, who has actually raced with glasses under the helmet. But I think he yeah. also had a prescription visor at some point, but that was rumoured to have cost millions. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not something they can do all the time. Uh, Ralph Schumacher wore contacts, Nico Rosberg, I think, wore contact lenses and said it was a, a bit of a hassle. And the only modern driver who I can think of in the single-seaters is Alex Sims, who is in, was that Formula E? I don't know if he's current. Yeah, Formula yeah. E and also uh, World Endurance. Too. Right, and he, he drives in glasses. But, but generally, yeah, having a frame in your helmet seems suboptimal. So as a contact lens wearer, that is the way I would go. So I wear contact lenses probably way too way too often. I should, shouldn't wear them as much. But whenever I put glasses on, I get to halfway through the day and I'm like, oh, I can feel the air on my eyes. And I get, get so used to having that contact lens covering. Uh, when you chop onions in contact lenses, you don't cry because it doesn't get really? through. Yeah, it doesn't get through. So I'm surprised wow. sometimes I'm chopping onions. I'm like, what, what the hell is that? It's because I'm wearing glasses. Um, uh, but yeah, so contact lenses is the way forward, but it's high risk because if it pops out, there's really nothing you can do. I, I suspect, Matt, that a lot of the drivers that don't have 20-20 vision, like our own Kyle Power, they just accept it and they just get used to seeing the world a bit blurry. Because you don't, you don't need to read the curb, I suppose. You, you only need to know where it is. So as long as you can make out that black and white blur and that other blur is a Formula One car, maybe, they, maybe you're just okay. Well, I don't know about that. I, I think different drivers are different, but a lot of drivers will, you know, will be noted for picking out a very singular object as to, to be their breaking point. And it's not the kind of thing you're going to pick out with like 2080 or 2090 vision. I suspect, uh, I mean, perhaps motorsport selects to a certain extent for people who can manage that either with poor vision or with, with excellent vision. But I would I would have the surgery eventually um, because glasses can be a pain. I've raced with glasses and a helmet before. It works. It's fine. I, I've oh. raced with contacts. That also works. It's fine. But the best thing is just being able to see clearly what you want to see. Mike Stoner in our patron live chat says F1 isn't a spec series. Oh, my God. Can we can we kick him out? <laughs> that's God, that's awful. I you you put up with him. That's I absolutely awful. And uh, well, apparently Nico Hulkenberg went your way and did the the laser surgery and stuff like that. So I think Thomas, I think we're, we're guessing a little bit, but we have got a range here of contact lenses, and I think contact lens wearers we, we are constantly in a uh, a state of risk where we just accept. Like I ha constantly have spare contact lenses in my backpack because they are. Uh, single use ones but in the olden days when i first got them in the 90s you'd pay like 40 or 50 quid for your one set of contact lenses and you'd have to clean them every day and you had these scenes of like if you lost it on the football pitch you're like everyone stop i've lost a contact lens and you'd be like searching on the ground trying to recover this contact lens well it's not like that anymore now um you, you couldn't do it in a pit stop uh, but it's less kind of of a faff than it was in the in the olden days so i think that's what most of them do they either just don't see as well and so they can't read it. They, they wouldn't be able to watch the TV screens or they, they go for contact lenses or have laser surgery. OK, we have got now a, a technical question. Let's see if you know this. Nick asks, if the drivers have to press the DRS button on their steering wheel to activate DRS, how do they know that they're within one second to use it? And how do the FIA monitor drivers using it when they shouldn't? And initially I, I read that and I went, <laughs> come on, Nick. It's, um, uh, yeah, how is that? Well, they track it uh, via GPS, I believe, but the driver gets either and or a tone in their ear, like a beep, telling them they're good to go, or they get a warning on their dash, a light on their dash saying that, that DRS is active for them on this particular lap. Plus, their engineer will be there saying, you know, you're, you're nine tenths, you're seven tenths, you're five tenths. So, so that they, they are generally appraised of whether or not they have access to DRS multiple different ways. Sorry, I tried to make it longer, but that's it. No, that's fine. Hey, look, not all questions. I, and I, fact, I like, if we're going to do this more casually, I, I like that someone can ask what seems like a, if it feels like a stupid question, there'll be other people, there'll be other kids in the class who also don't know. So oh, I appreciate Formula that. Formula One's so complicated that there's always someone who doesn't know the thing that you don't know too. And uh -huh. you're just braver for asking it. Thanks, Nick. And uh, 
Georgie Busso uh, says, Hi, I'm a big fan of the pod. I was wondering where I could find the source song of that theme music because it sounds like a banger. All the best for the remainder of the season from Georgie. Uh, right, okay, uh, there is no song, I'm afraid. The, the title track, uh, this one, is by Gareth McRae and it was developed solely for Miss Apex. And you're right, it is an absolute banger. I love the pushes, I love the energy. It suits Miss Apex perfectly. Gareth uh, realised that we had some copyright issues with the music we were using because it really, really compl complicated. The band that did our original theme music, they had some tragedy and we were unable to secure the rights to keep using it and YouTube kept pinging us. So Gareth went out of his way to just develop that purely for us and Gareth will develop music for you as well. He can develop music for TV, for your games, podcasts and more. Uh, so if you want to email him, it's highpassmusicianjudio at gmail.com. There will be a link. There's always a link every episode. It's in the show notes. Because yeah. we're so grateful to Gareth for doing that. We always have his details in the show notes. So you can check that out and you can and hire him if you wish to. And finally, Matt, Richard Tier tweeted me and he said, because of your podcast, every time there's a collision, I yell at the screen, whose fault is it? In an awful accent. <laughs> And so I, I put it to our patron Slack group. I said, we're recording a show later. Someone said they yell, whose fault is it at the screen? I like the bumper. And are, are there any other missed apex isms that have broken into real life? And there's loads. So we've got loads of replies. I'm going to go through some of them. A trucking Trevor said, I play Forza Motorsport with some work friends on a Friday. And on Monday, we come in with all the crashes and play the whose fault is it bumper. And it's ended up being a massive hit. No pun intended, I'm sure. Um, Walt says, I've also told my wife during, uh, during an argument that we would let the house burn down around us as long as we could determine who was at fault. And that went over well. So for <laughs> it didn't work, did it? <laughs> for context, I, I say the whose fault is it maximum blame scenario is due to the fact that uh, me and my wife, we have the opposite of the Mercedes no blame environment. We must establish blame. And I have maximum often said, blame. yeah. If there's a house fire at our house, we stop, we decide whose fault it is, and then we evacuate, grab the pets, and if there's time, the children. Okay, uh, so, yeah, uh, also Steve Tarotta says, there are no, yeah, the fact that there are no re uh, racing incidents and that being neutral makes you a dirty neutral. Uh, Amber says, at my house, when someone messes up, we say, oh, no, you missed the apex. That's good to know. Uh, EJ, again, yeah, says, oh, no, you missed the apex, has entered his life. And um, uh, Matt, 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 Mattis Hackman says uh, he tries to imitate me doing an impression of Summer's accent when saying, oh, no, you missed the oh apex. Oh, no. Oh, no, you missed the apex. <laughs> and Rob says, I refer to unnamed people as Derek a lot. And, of course, Turnip, Morgan says, Turnip has become part of my lexicon. And there's some other unrepeatable things that people have copied from Kyle Power. So I am glad that Mr. Apex has, has, has entered from the podcasting shed into your homes. Uh, follow Matt at MattPT55. He'll be joining me for the race review. Who else have we got, Matt? We have Chris Stevens and Alex Van Jean joining us. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Always, always chaos when Van Jean's on and uh, always informative when chris stevens is on as well follow me at spanners ready on twitter on threads i'm trying to be active on tiktok follow Miss apex on tiktok and i'm doing those things where i have an opinion i'll point the phone at my face which seem reasonably popular so go and follow us there threads and instagram too whatever we see you next work hard be kind and have fun this was Miss apex podcast <laughs>